Hey, great to see you today, 930 crowd. Uh, a, little bit of, uh, a little bit of possible rain is not going to deter you from being here. That's because you are the few, you are the proud, you are the chosen, you are the 930 service. Um, excited to have you guys here. I'd like to start off by sharing something with you. That was life-changing for me, and any time something life-changing happens in your life, you should share it with somebody else. Are you with me? Had the privilege, I think now probably my fifth or sixth year, I guess, of being the chaplain of the Lake County Fair. And, uh, you know, if there's any high achievement in your life... That's one of them. And so ultimately what that means is they bring me in for the livestock shows and the livestock sales. And I pray over that time. And all joking aside, I'm grateful that the Lake County uh, Fair Board still does prayer and they still do the national anthem. And, you know, give them credit for, uh, I give them credit for doing that. Uh, Last night was the swine sale. And so my prayer was, uh, and dear God, this little piggy went to market, and this little piggy <laughs> went home. Uh, no, it wasn't, but it would have been good. So what was so life-changing? It's my last night of the fair. They're still open today. They actually extended for one more day. If it doesn't rain out, you're able to go there. But I told my wife, I had a long day yesterday, and I said, hey, it's the last day of the fair. Um, I'll probably be there around dinner time. And she's like, hey. Go ahead and get yourself something to eat. Now, here's what I want you to know about buying fair food. It's a whole lot more manageable to buy fair food for one person (laughs) than it is for a whole family that wants, and every kid wants to go to a different spot. So I'm walking through. There's tons of options. I've already eaten there throughout the week. And there it was. The clouds opened up. And light shined down on this one place called Spaghetti Eddie's. And they have this sign that says, the super stick. And it's pizza on a stick. And I thought, you know what? That's one of my bucket list items in life. So pepperoni, Colby Jack cheese, Wrapped up, there's this fried, you know, garlic dough that's all in it. They shave, I mean, they, they spread garlic and they drizzle butter and Parmesan cheese on the top of it. And then they give you one cup of pizza sauce to dip it in. And so I went out to my, my truck and I sat there for a moment and I had a little moment with the Lord. And I opened it up and it was just like, oh my goodness, it was so awesome. And, you know, I, I live in a gluten-free home. So I was actually kind of cheating on my family. <laughs> and, and I, I kind of went into the shade of this tree and tucked away. And I ate it and I told Jamie how great it was. And she says, I'm happy for you. And so the reason why I want to share that with you today is when I got done with that yesterday, I realized something. If I had died last night, I think I would have achieved everything that I could have achieved here on this earth. Chaplain of the Lake County Fair and I had pizza on a stick. Amen. And so if you want your life to be forever changed, next year, Lake County Fair, pizza on a stick. Tell them Pastor Brooks sent you. It won't get you anything, but just tell them I sent you. (laughs) Maybe they'll give me a half off next time. I don't know. I'm going to invite you to take your Bible today. Acts chapter 1 is what we're going to be looking at, Acts chapter 1. So I would invite you to take your Bible today to look there. Obviously, uh, we showed again that lead-in video about the aftermath What happened next after the resurrection of Jesus Christ? Okay, we learned he rose from the grave. That's an exciting thing, obviously. But what happened next? There's so much more that continued after that very very, um, life-changing event. Last week, the, the message was called, Are You In? Are You In? And it was really giving us a picture that the apostles, which ultimately were disciples, and I'm going to talk about that, they were the disciples that now have seen Jesus, and they're known as apostles later, that they had the rubber meet the road. What are you going to do? Bible tells us they had locked themselves in their home for fear of the Jews. They were scared. Jesus appeared to them. He showed up in their house. Doors were closed. They were nervous. What are we going to do? And Jesus said, hey, peace Peace be with you, as the Father has sent me, 
I also send you. Eight days later, what happened? They were still there in that house. Jesus showed up once again, and he told them once again, as the Father has sent me, I, I also send you. And then, then Peter just gets up one day and says, that's it. I'm done with the ministry. I'm going fishing. Everybody chimes in, said, brother, if you're going fishing, we're going as well. And it says they fished all night, and they caught nothing. They didn't catch anything. Don't think for a second when you step outside of God's will that he's going to shower down blessings from heaven on your life, because he's not. He's not. He wants you right where he wants you in the center of his will. They left the ministry. They went out there. Uh, The Lord appeared to them once again out there in the water and said, hey, why don't you cast your net on the other side? And so uh, Peter realized it was Jesus after they got this big haul of fish. He threw himself into the sea. The Bible says that he swam 100 yards. He made his way to Jesus. Uh, Jesus had a little little, uh, breakfast there on the uh, water's edge, just decided had fish and bread for him just to kind of rub it in a little bit. And Jesus said these words to Peter, do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? And the third time Peter, it says he was grieved, like, Lord, you know I love you. Why do you keep asking me? And Jesus said something in his final words, his final conversation with Peter that I think is so important. He said, follow me. Now, Peter had already heard follow me once before, but I'm telling you, there was a different tone of voice that day. This is the last conversation, pretty much, that we have listed in Scripture, with the exception of what little bit we're going to talk about today, as to what happened there at the very end. I don't know about you, but the last conversation you have with somebody, if they look you in the face and they say, follow me, man, you know Jesus meant business that day. I did four four funerals this week, and in one of them, I saw a guy that owns a bait shop that I used to go to all the time, and he said this to me. This is what he said. He goes, man, you sure have come a long way in life from that little boy that used to come in the bait shop all the time with you and your dad, and he said, you've really made something of yourself, and I said, well, when you are the chaplain of Lake County Fair, I mean, come on. And I told him this. I said, well, I'm still fishing, but God's got me going after something else now. And and I meant that. You know, Jesus said, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Today, we're going to look at Christ's last moments on earth before his ascension into heaven. It's going to be in Acts uh, chapter 1. And and I tell you, I believe the resurrection was a real thing. I believe that Jesus Christ was rose from the grave. There's a gentleman named Charles Colson. He's been a writer for years. This is one of his quotes about the resurrection. He said, I know the resurrection is a fact. Watergate proved it to me. How? Because 12 men testified that they had seen Jesus raised from the dead, and they proclaimed that truth for over 40 years, never once denying it. Every one of them beaten, tortured, stoned, and put in prison. And they would not have endured that if it wasn't true. Watergate embroiled 12 of the most powerful men in the world. And they couldn't keep a lie for more than three weeks. You're telling me 12 apostles could keep a lie for 40 years? Absolutely impossible. And so the amazing thing for me about the story of the resurrection is that we're still telling it today. It still changes our lives even today. The title of the message today is The Grand Finale. The grand finale, if you've ever gone to a fireworks show, the fact is the beginning's okay, but you're really there for what? The end. Man, you, wanna, you want the grand finale. You want to see what, what $20,000 getting blown away in a second looks like. Because you know somebody else paid the bill and you're glad it wasn't you. And I mean, they are throwing that stuff up there. And it's like, man, the second you think it's going to be over, it keeps going. Well, this is the grand finale for Jesus and the apostles. Now, there's a difference in terminology. Disciple means student or pupil. And the disciples were called of God. But then they became apostles when they got to see Jesus after his resurrection. And so you'll see that reference In Scripture today, as we look at the grand finale, Acts chapter 1, verses 1 through 11, I'm just going to share with you today three 
truths that will help us grow in our walk with Christ. And this is what it says in verse 1. The first account, I composed Theophilus. Theophilus uh, just means friend or friend of God. About all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day that he was taken up to heaven. After he had, by the Holy Spirit, given orders to the apostles whom he had chosen. To these he also presented himself alive after his suffering by many convincing proofs. Appearing to them over a period of 40 days, speaking the things concerning the kingdom of God. Gathering them together, he commanded them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait. For what the Father had promised, which he said, you have heard from me. For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Verse 6. So when they had come together, they began asking him, Lord, is it at this time that you are restoring the kingdom to Israel? And he said to them, it is not for you to know times or epochs, which the Father has fixed by his own authority. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses, both in Jerusalem and all Judea and Apopka and Paisley and Eustace and Tiberias. And Mount Dora, and even to the remotest part of the earth, which is Aster. <laughs> so, stop. And so verse 9 says, and after these things, uh, after, excuse me, after he had said these things, he was lifted up while they were looking on, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And as they were gazing intently into the sky while he was going, behold, two men in white clothing stood beside them. They said, men of Galilee, why are you standing here looking into the sky? This Jesus, whom has been taken up into heaven, will come in, the, in just the same way as you have watched him go into heaven. I don't know about you, but if I was there that day, I think I would have been like. <sighs> Y'all ever heard of David Blaine? You know, David Blaine, I mean, he thinks, he, he thinks he's the first person that ever levitated before. Nuh-uh. <laughs> Jesus is like. I mean, straight up into heaven. And here's what's great. They were gazing intently. And these people said, men of Galilee, why are you doing this? Don't you realize he's coming again? He's coming again. And he's going to come the exact same way. Grand finale, three truths that will help you grow in your walk with Christ. Number one is this. When the Lord speaks, listen, listen. Chapter 21 of the Gospel of John, Jesus speaking to Peter, do you love me, do you love me, do you love me? Two words, follow me. Now that sounds simple, right? But then Jesus follows it up with, oh, by the way, at the end of your life, you're going to die on a cross for me. I mean, I don't know about you, last time you signed up for a job and somebody said, hey, do you mind having to give your life? Do you realize there's going to be shame and and, and torture and pain and heartache in what you're about to do? Yet he still committed to do it. And then in the the beginning of Acts, it says that the Lord appeared to them um, with many convincing proofs, presenting himself alive after suffering. It says, for a period of 40 days, speaking of the things concerning the kingdom of God. So, you know, the Lord was really getting down to business. I mean, he was really laying it all on the line. And here's the difference. There's a difference between listening to something and obeying something. I mean, a lot of us hear things with our ears, but when do we follow through and, and truly obey? I don't know if you've ever had maybe a deathbed, you know, talk with someone, meaning that they were on their deathbed and they said, you know, hey, before I die, I want you to know I left $100,000 under the bed, you know, in the backyard, in a jar, take three steps. No, I mean, I haven't had that conversation yet. But I mean, somebody says, I love you, or I'm so proud of you, or even when I'm gone, I want you to know I'm going to be in heaven with the Lord. The other day, I got called over to a family's house. I've been over there before. Um, I actually did this lady's I did the, this lady's son's funeral and her husband's funeral, and she's under hospice care, and they asked me to come pray with her, and so we walked in the house, and, and she, was, I mean, she, was, she was getting close to eternity. I mean, we didn't know how, how close, and her daughter says, Mama, Pastor Brooks is here, and she had just enough energy to go like this. She knew she didn't want to look at me. <laughs> Kind of cracked that eye up a little bit. And, and, and I said, hey, hey, don't worry. Uh, I'm just here to pray with you. And I put my hand on her arm. And I just said a, a nice quiet prayer in her home. And, and I prayed this. This is what I prayed. In the middle of the prayer, I said, and even though you walk 
through the valley of the shadow of death, you don't have to fear evil, for God is with you. And I said, in Jesus' name, amen. And I reached out, and I, and I told her I loved her, and uh, the family wanted to take me outside to the shed to show me all of the sewing machines that this lady had collected throughout the years. She, at one point, had collected over, uh, over 100 sewing machines. Yeah, she's going to be on TLC pretty soon for that. Hoarder's sewing machine edition. <clears throat> and I left. I, we talked maybe five, ten minutes outside. I got in my truck and I left. They called me about a minute later. Said, Pastor Brooks, we walked back inside. She's gone. She's gone. I thought, well, our last conversation, the very last conversation, the words that she heard was this. Even though you walk through the valley of the shadow of death, guess what? You don't have to fear any evil for God is with you. And maybe in that moment, wouldn't that have been awesome? Maybe in that moment, God just took her right up. You ever think about the last conversation you had with somebody? Well, here it is right here. Jesus is sharing these last few words with these men. You know, he had been with these guys for three years. They got to hear him every single day, face to face. How many of you have heard Jesus through his word for 30 years, 40 years, 50 years? The question is, are we listening, but also are we obeying the word of God? Revelation chapter 1, uh, verse 3 says this, Blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of prophecy and heed the things which are written in it. It's one thing to hear, it's another thing to heed. You know what heed means? It means to ultimately obey. When the Lord speaks, we need to listen carefully. We really need to give God our undivided attention. Bless her heart, Abigail, when she was younger, would take her hands when she was trying to get my attention. Daddy, 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 daddy. And if I wasn't paying attention, she'd take her hands on my face and she'd go like this. Listen with your face. <laughs> Any of you have those kids, when you talk talking to them, they're like, and you're like, could you just pay attention for five seconds? And she'd literally take her hands like a vice grip on me. And she'd say, listen with your face. How many times does God reach down from heaven in our lives? When we are all over the place and he's like, would you listen? Would you listen? Give me your undivided attention. I don't know how many of you are, are so busy that sometimes you get a little bit forgetful. Anybody in this room forgetful? <laughs> Ladies, don't raise your hand for your husband, okay? That is disrespectful, all right? Story goes as follows. This 80-year-old couple were having trouble remembering things, and so they decided they needed to go to the doctor to maybe get checked out and make sure nothing was wrong. When they arrived at the doctor's office, they explained that they'd been having problems remembering things and so after checking the couple out, the doctor says, physically, you're both okay, but you might ought to start writing things down, making notes to help you remember what's being said. The couple thought, thanked the doctor, and left. Later that night, they were watching television, and the old man got up from his chair, and his wife says, where are you going? And, she, and he says, well, I'm going into the kitchen. And she says, well, while you're in there, get me a bowl of ice cream, please. Sure, honey, I'd be happy to. And the wife says, well, don't you think you ought to write that down so you don't forget it? And he says, I'm not going to forget it. I can remember that. You want a bowl of ice cream. She goes, well, I also want some chopped strawberries on top, if you could do that for me. And he says, okay, fine. And she says, well, don't you think you ought to write that down so you don't forget? And he goes, I'm not going to forget. I'm going to remember it. You want a bowl of ice cream with strawberries chopped up on top of it. And she says, well, you know what? I also want some whipped cream. Will you put some whipped cream on top of it. And he says, okay, fine, I'll do it. And she says, don't you think, remember what the doctor said, you probably ought to write that down. He said, you want a bowl of ice cream with chopped strawberries and whipped cream. How hard can it be? 20 minutes later, after being in the kitchen, he returned to his wife and handed her a plate of bacon and eggs. <laughs> and she started to just stare at the plate for a moment. And she said, you forgot my toast. Anybody in this room forgetful? You get a preacher up on stage that preaches his heart out, and you remember the sermon for about 30 seconds. And then all of a sudden, you know what happens? We walk out these doors, 
and we get busy, busy, busy. I used to, I was the kid in church that mom would hand me the, you know, Sunday bulletin for me to play hangman and do tic-tac-toe and crossword puzzles and, you know, draw funny pictures of the pastor. Don't ever do that. And then I, as I got older, I start watching people, start watching people actually write stuff down and underline things in their Bible. And, you know, I, you don't know this, but when my dad passed away last year, we were going through his belongings, and I found a box about this big, stacked to the top of every single Sunday bulletin from every service at First Baptist Church of Umatilla, and every single one of them, he would write the title of the sermon that I preached. He would write every sermon point, every scripture reference, any illustration that I shared. And, and I would tell you, you talk about having a little moment with the Lord. But my dad knew, you know what, if I'm ever going to retain this, I'm hearing it. But the only way I'm going to obey it is I got to write it down. I got to make it a part of my life. Can you imagine this last conversation Jesus had as he knows I'm about to be gone? Parents, you ever manipulate your children a little bit when they're younger to do things and make it sound a little bit more exciting than it actually is? You know, some people say that that's wrong. I think that's good parenting. <laughs> Bennett and Bethany, six and four. Bethany's turning five tomorrow. Uh, she said if you're looking for any last-minute gift ideas, she'd love Bass Pro Shops gift cards. <laughs> Hand them to her dad, and her dad will give them to her. They're so funny, you know, I can come up to, all right, all right, guys, listen, this is what dad needs from you before I, I'm going to leave. I got to go to work, but this is what, will you be a part of my team? Who wants to be on dad's, I want to, I want to be on, can I be on your team, dad? Can I be on your team? I'm like, all right, you want to be on my team? All right, you're on my team. You want to be, all right, you're on my team. All right, here we go, team, are you ready? This is what I need you to do. Can you do it? Whatever you want. This is what I need you to do. While I'm gone at work today, I need you to clean this bedroom like you've never cleaned, you know. I mean, they're all over the place. I tell you what, if you clean this room and I come home, dad's going to be so proud and this needs to be put away and those need to be hung up and we'll do it, we'll do it. Here I come pulling in the driveway and they're out there panting like a bunch of dogs. <laughs> We're on your team. I say, hey guys, how's it going? You got to come in the house. You got to come in the house. All right, all right. So I get there in the living room, and they say, close your eyes, close your eyes. And they grab me by the hand. I'm like, you ever had a four-year-old and a six-year-old take you somewhere where your eyes are closed? <laughs> so then they open the door, but they still tell me to keep my eyes closed because they want to walk in and turn back around so they can see the expression on my face. And they've got the room perfectly clean. And they go just like this, ta-da! We're on your team! Can you imagine... Jesus told the apostles, you're going to receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you need to be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and even to the remotest parts of the earth. And they had just been told, he's coming back again. And when he comes back, because you're a part of his team, I hope that the Lord can look at the work that we've done and say, man, well done. Well done, my good and faithful Servant. The second thing that we can learn is that patience can lead to great things. Look at verse 4. It says this, And gathering them together, he commanded them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait for what the Father had promised, which he said, You have heard from me, for John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. And I'm going to explain that here in just a moment. Unfortunately, most people are not willing to wait for something good. We want it now. We live in a society today that wants everything right now. And I'm going to tell you where we got it from. I'll tell you exa exactly where we got it from. We got it from Veruca on Willy Wonka in the Chocolate Factory. Y'all know her, don't you? I mean, how, who would want to have that girl as their kid? I mean, she was just such a whiner, and she told her dad, I want a Oompa Loompa right now. And then they made it into the room with the geese that lay the golden eggs. And what'd she tell her dad? I want, a, I want one of those geese right there that lays a golden egg. And her dad says, anything you want, darling, we'll get it for you when this is all done. And she says, no, I want it now. And then she had that old frizzy hair and mean looking face. And 
she said this. She sings this song, and she says, don't care how I want it now. And then she's going down the thing. Y'all know what I'm talking about? Come on, you know you've seen that before. She goes down in the uh, trash heap. I don't know. I love that part, man, because I don't like her. But it was, she, she's just like, I don't, I don't want it later. And here's what's great. Here's what's great. Charlie, although he did go into the fizzy lifting room, and that was, <laughs> why am I talking about this right now? <laughs> he, he, he waited to the very end, and he ended up getting everything. A lot of times, we don't want to be patient. And the Lord's telling the apostles, guys, hold on. Don't lose hope. Stay here in Jerusalem. Something's about to happen, and it's going to be big. Let me tell you this, receiving the Holy Spirit, it's life-changing. It's life-changing. And you say, well, where do I go to receive the Holy Spirit? Well, if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, you already got it. You don't have to go to some second class. You don't have to go to a different church. You don't have to pray a certain prayer. The day that you repent of your sins, the day that you call upon the Lord, he gives you his presence, his spirit, the Holy Spirit of God in your life. You know, uh, I would like watching this commercial about Wayfair, Wayfair, the, where you can buy home decor and furnishings and stuff like that. And, you know, it's funny, they always have guys on the Wayfair commercial. Seriously? I'm just going to tell you right now, okay? I don't have a problem with us buying furniture at our house, but I'm not at home scrolling through an iPad looking at Wayfair stuff, all right? I'm a man. Oh, great. I just offended somebody. You're at home watching. And the guy says this. He... <coughs> <clears throat> don't quench the Holy Spirit. <laughs> so he, he finds out that Wayfair is now offering free shipping. Does anybody know that commercial? And this is what he says, game changer. Man, the apostles, when they realized we're about to get the Holy Spirit of God. Let me tell you something. That's a game changer. It's a game changer. Being a Christian without the Holy Spirit is like trying to drive a car without a motor. You're like the Flintstones. Seriously, how did the Flintstones make it around? They had to use their own strength, but having the Holy Spirit of God is like driving one of the new cars today that every once in a while you can take your hands off the wheel. It'll park itself. It's got alerts that warn you when you're about to head into an area that you probably shouldn't go. It's got sensors that remind you that you're being silly and, and, and you know, driving too fast, things like that. The Holy Spirit is here to guide us and take care of us. You know, patience is something that many people don't want to have. A lot of believers, a lot of believers will say, I, I need patience. Newsflash. Galatians chapter 5 says, you got it. For the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience. It's there. It's there. You just got to apply it to your life. I was watching Alabama played in their A-Day game yesterday, spring game. Uh, we won. And... Uh, I guess we lost, too, at the same time. But some of you, your teams played in the eight, you know, your, your game, your spring game. And you know, they did a little story about Alabama's quarterback from last year, Mac Jones. I just want to tell you just briefly about this guy's life. He comes in as a four-star recruit, but he comes in behind two guys that are now NFL quarterbacks. I mean, this is a guy that he could have gone anywhere and probably started, but he, 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 he waited his turn. Freshman, sophomore, junior year, and finally in his senior year, he gets an opportunity. Those two other quarterbacks are now in the NFL. He's there. And for years, he idolized Tim Tebow. And he keep this little card. You know how quarterbacks sometimes will have a little thing on their wrist here with the, the plays? He had this little card slid in there that was laminated that he wrote years and years ago. And on the top of it, it said, BLT, be like Tebow. And he remembered every day you go out there, and there was little notes under it. Be a leader. Be courageous. Always have a smile on your face, even in good times and in bad times. B-L-T. And this guy was the epitome of an individual that could have said, I want a starting spot now. But he waited his turn, and he ends up breaking records like nobody has at Alabama. He ends up winning a title, winning the championship, and I just think, how many of us 
when we give our life to the Lord, we think the sky's going to open up and everything perfect is going to happen. Can I tell you, sometimes when you give your life to the Lord, the sky opens up and it rains on you. Some of you can probably give testimony to that. And you think, I thought my life was going to get nice and clean and pretty and all the wrinkles were going to be ironed out. Sometimes it doesn't work out that way. But in that moment, in that moment, we can be mindful that the Holy Spirit of God is there to guide us. And the Lord says, be patient. Lastly, one more thing that we can learn is that our power, our power comes from within. Verse 6, I'm just going to talk about it real quick. It says, so when they had come together, they were asking him, saying, Lord, is it at this time that you're restoring the kingdom of Israel? He said, it is not for you to know times or epochs which the Father has fixed by his own authority. So I want to say something about verse number 6 real quick. They, they pretty much thought that the kingdom was about to change. You know, there are people today that are writing books about the end of the world, the apocalypse. On this day, at this time, uh, life as we know it is going to be done and over with. And they're making tons of money. And people are buying their books. Let me tell you something real quick. Every one of those books are lies. Because the Bible says only one person knows when that time's going to be. Only one person. And it's the Father. And you say, but Pastor Brooks, with the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, the Trinity, how is it that the Father is the only one that has that time fixed? And I, and I have the answer for you, and it's prophetic. I don't know. I really don't. But I know one thing. I don't know when it is. And I'm going to quit gazing intently in the sky. Why? There's work to be done here. The Bible goes on to say this. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. Somebody say power. power. Yeah. yeah. That was halfway decent, but, you know, 11 o'clock service will probably do it better. <laughs> but you will receive power. Somebody say power. power. Yeah. When the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and even to the remotest part. Of the earth. I'm going to break it down for you real quick. It says, and you will, you will, it's a promise from God, you will receive power. The second part is receive power. That word in the Greek means it's, it's dunamis. It means dynamite. We get the word dynamite. Churches need more dynamite power in them. I mean, don't, don't raise your hand, but how many of you been in a dead, boring, dry church? And you're just like, Good Lord, get me out of here. Or you're like this. Or you're playing hangman on the bulletin. You know, it's just like, how can we, listen, how can we have the greatest message in the world and it be so lame? How can this, how can a church that's preaching a message with power only ever have 50 people in it and they've been around for 150 years? That, that's not right. That's not right. We're not using the power that God has given to us. And the Holy Spirit power isn't something that you get at the Church of God or Assembly of God or Pentecostal Church. I had a lady walk out of our church one day, and she goes, I'm going to ask you a question. And she kind of did one of these numbers. That normally means they're fixing to pit me, you know. And she, I'm going to ask you a question. Do you believe in the Holy Spirit? I said, oh, yeah, I got all of it. Are you serious? You got all the Holy Spirit? I said, you better believe it. You mean you know how to do all these things? I know how to do whatever the Holy Spirit teaches me to do. We, we've got this, like my dad used to tell me, oh man, I went to my Granny Lee's church back in the day, they were jumping pews, scared me to death. I think some of you need to start jumping pews, amen? I mean, some of us need to start moving a little bit more, like we got the Holy Spirit of God within us. We were doing fireworks at our house a couple years ago, and you know, I, I am a tightwad, and I'm a tightwad because it's called good stewardship. And it's mainly because I want to make sure at the end of the day I'm able to feed my kids. And so they want to go get fireworks, and I'm like, all right, you got to start with a limit, a budget when you go to those fireworks shows, I mean those fireworks stands, because those people are outrageous. But I got one, and they talked me into getting this one called Hogzilla. 
I had a big old pig on the front and like fire shooting out his nostrils and, you know, drool coming down on the side of his face. And it was our last one. We've been doing good fireworks. I got the kids way far back. Man, you want to see how fast this preacher is? Let him do a fireworks show. Because I'll tell you, while I'm holding the box, the, it's called a cake, while you're holding it in your car, you're not afraid of it at all. You know how much power is inside of it. But when you light that bad boy, I'm not staying around to talk to it. I'm out. So I had these two blocks set up out on our property and a piece of plywood. And my kids, I was like, hey, who's got the best dad ever? They're like, me. Like, Who wants to be on my team? Come light this. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> Here, Bethany, you're four. You can light it. <clears throat> so I light this thing and I take off running. And they start screaming. And I'm like, why are they screaming? The thing hasn't even gone off yet. Well, the plywood flipped over. Hogzilla came alive. And I'm thinking it's aiming right towards me. I'm going to tell you something. Forget those kids. I'm running to the house. Save yourself. And it's aiming towards the woods. Thank the Lord. And thank the Lord also it was in a wet season. And that thing starts shoo, shoo, shoo. Boom, boom, boom. It's blowing up in the woods, and it is going like crazy. I'm scared to death, and the kids just went like this. Yay! <laughs> Who's got the best dad ever? Me! And here's the thing that blows my mind. This, seriously, this inspired me in my walk with Jesus years ago. The same Holy Spirit that the apostles received in the book of Acts that literally started the early church, I have. And can I tell you something real quick, believer? The same Holy Spirit that gave them the power to heal and to preach and for souls to be saved and miracles to take place, you've got and you've got and you've got. And so if the work of God is not being done in your life, don't blame God. It's probably because you haven't lit that flame. Because the power is within you. And then I'm going to close with this. It says, and you shall be my witnesses both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and even to the remotest parts of the earth. I've done this so many times and every time it blesses my socks off when I do it. But today I'm going to do it a little bit different. Today I'm going to call out the city that, you're, that you currently live in, or at least I'm going to try to. And what I want you to do, as a witness of the Lord, when I name your city, I just want you to stand. You don't have to say woohoo. You don't have to give a shout out for Paisley. Paisley always wants to give a shout out, let me tell you. I just want you to stand up where you are in that moment, all right? So if you're here today, from Umatilla, would you stand? Paisley. Altoona. Wearsdale, Oklawaha, got to throw them in, Ocala, DeLand, Grand Island, Leesburg, Howie in the Hills, Astatula, Mount Dora, Sorrento, Mount Plymouth, Tangerine, some fruity people over there, <laughs> Eustace, Tavares, Popka, Lady Lake, The Villages, Fruitland Park. Last service we had people still seated and a guy says, Mascot. Somebody else said, Groveland. Somebody else said, Aster. All right, y'all are seated. Where are you from? Brunswick? Georgia? Georgia! Man! All right, where are you from? Boston, is that near Georgia? Close? Couple miles? Y'all got the same accent. All right, I see somebody else over there. Who doesn't I call? Where? Big Pine Key? What about y'all back there? Sanford? Hey, let me tell you. All right, who else did I miss? Pittman? I'm only naming incorporated cities, okay? 
Yeah, they, what are you, the mayor? All those in favor, say aye. Here's the mayor right here. Hey, if I didn't name your city, go ahead and stand on up. I want you to know, and you shall be my witnesses, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and even to the remotest parts of the earth. We are commanded by God. And the proof is this. The fact is this. If everybody standing in this room takes that verse to heart, we can change the world. We can change the world through the power of Jesus Christ. Amen? You think for a second Umatilla is a small town? Folks, we're reaching Boston. That's what I'm talking about. Boston, Georgia, let me tell you. <laughs> Let's pray.